morning, my friends. It is definitely morning. Let me turn this off for a minute. Uh, here I am at a job site waiting for the clients to show up. They're supposed to be here at 8 o'clock. I'm here early, so it is what it is. I've had a couple conversations and I've witnessed a couple of videos lately and where a topic has come up both on the Brigade channel and the video response channel on uh, the subject of Star Trek. They were a role playing game. Now, I understand that there's a resurg resurgence in it, interest in it, and or there is this newer updated version of the game system being put out by I'm not sure who. Now I have most of the uh, original RPG system that was put out by FASA in the early 80s. One of these days I think I might get around to reviewing it. Which, it's an interesting game system. It's different. There's a lot of aspects about Star Trek that's different from your typical space canon. Your typical Star Wars and space operas and things of that nature. Because of their fundamental philosophy so to speak now I have run a number of campaigns back in the day with that system and I tried to well first things I learned was it's much easier to have your player character group be junior officers as part of a larger crew and that the senior officers should be NPCs that way there's no bickering over well I'm the Captain Kirk and I'm, 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 I'm Commander Spock and so on and so forth and then there's the you know, the one person shines above everybody else scenario which can be problematic the uh, challenge or one of the challenges for Star Trek is the character classes themselves because like space opera it warrants it lends itself more to the scientific medical exploration side of gaming and less about shooting up things so to speak so you can go entire campaigns without ever firing a weapon in anger you know, occasionally maybe in defense if you're looking from a, the ship's perspective or uh, if you're doing a lot of away teams and true exploration, well, okay, sure. But you don't actively go out of your way to shoot the space goblins every chance you get. You know, unless you're in a, playing a campaign in, in one of the many, many wars that the Federation was involved in. That's where we get into the topic of something that, that always irked me a little bit. But if you do a little deep research into Starfleet itself and the Federation, you'll recognize that while overtly it shows a pacifistic philosophy of, of shoot last, negotiate first, and all, when at all possible, avoid bloodshed, the truth of it is they're quite in deep almost all the time. There's just enough frequency where they get peaceful time that they seem to forget their the fact that they're in a hostile universe to say that they don't cater to that is is a fallacy because you can look at most of the heavy starships and realize that they're capable of holding their own and more or less taking on any significant threat of their era given time uh, they can bring together a significantly large fleet of those kinds of ships so space is vast now going back to if you do a little bit of research i used to have the the star trek uh, the starfleet field manual or manual or whatever and there's a couple sub branches mentioned of the federation in the federation that one included the very very rarely touched upon secret service so to speak you know the spy corps which comes up occasionally in one or two of the tv series very briefly they they, they, talk, they play it down for good reason because they are that cia version for start for for the federation they go and do the things and you know that the federation would have to be in total denial if, if they get caught doing it but yet they're necessary for any civilization to flourish safely. You cannot not keep an eye on your hostile neighbors and then occasionally meddle with their affairs. If it's to the, you know, that one hidden dagger saves, what was it, uh, the one life for the many? The one hidden dagger for the many guns philosophy, which is not necessarily a bad thing. 
it just looks bad when it gets brought into the light so it's a very possible place to play a campaign in the other one is starfleet has its version of the civil patrol or its version of the highway patrol if you will they actually have a core of starships and, and officers whose d duty is to police the space lanes per, per se they're looking for to you know, help stranded ships but they're also looking to keep the piracy down chase down pirates and bandits which do occur even in the the heart of the federation this still occurs there's a reason why the federation creates <clears throat> not only heavy cruisers but light destroyers and those light destroyers and medium destroyers and light cruisers a lot of them are in that service they 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 fill in the gaps because not every ship can be an exploration ship because there isn't a need for exploring you know high high exploration if you will in the core of the federation most of the things that have been explored or that are worthy of exploring have been have done so or there are long-term study facilities and space stations and what have you satellites and stuff that are deployed to keep an eye on long-term study projects now that's not to say that there are not large areas of the interior of the alpha quadrant and the federation proper that are fully explored because space is vast and they make that point there is a lot of space that lies within the, the borders of the federation that are still relatively unknown or very little little known because they're very little not that much is approached they don't approach them by much and then there's the uh we're back to that patrol thing where we've got patrol ships that protect certain locations for example the planet with the gate to the forever you know, that, that is a classified planet. It's supposed to keep people out of riffraff, but also keep people with nefarious projects and reasons for going there and messing with an artifact from a highly superior race that, that was from millions and millions of years ago because the Federation still doesn't quite 100% know what the things are capable of or what other artifacts maybe lay around on that planet. So they quarantine the planet to some degree. They've got their version of a blockade. I imagine they maintain a station or two in orbit and have uh, armed fighters, runabouts, what have you, patrolling the space around it, backed up by a couple uh, destroyers for the purpose of keeping the general riffraff out. Is that going to prevent a, you know, an, an incursion by the Romulans or the Klingons or what have you? No. They're going to come, and they're going to come in a much heavier weapon, a weaponized vessel, but they'll, they'll be there enough to whistle up the heavy cruisers of the Federation to come help. But that's their, that serves part of their role. So there are many possibilities for campaigns set in Star Trek that do not involve being a member of the flagship, for example. Now, and I've run campaigns as that in that mindset. Now my other more preferred uh, method is because of, for playing in Star Trek is that the majority of player characters and I'm not saying everybody because you do get some people that are cerebral and understand that not all games need to be uh, hack and slash per se but majority of them they want that high adventure they want that action they want that risk they want the potential to shoot something or to be shot at or stab something or what have you. Okay, that's part of the culture of the gaming industry. Okay. Gives me in my yawns. It doesn't matter. Always yawning day and night. Uh, and I just got up out of bed and a nice long sleep last night. I'm yawning. The uh, fact of the matter is, if you look at the history of the Federation, it is full of war. Uh, the, the first and second Romulan Wars, the, the three different wars that they fought with the Klingons. <coughs> the brief of it, kind of lopsided uh, Thomian War, uh, the Cardassian War, the, 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 the Dominion War, the, just the Borg, I mean, just the list just goes on and on and on. So there's plenty of opportunities to pick one of those timelines and have your player characters be involved in dealing with one of those galactic disputes, you know, and, and it's plausible. Uh, 
going back to, like I said, my own preferred take on this, and this is just me. I've always had a problem with the concept of a totally peace-loving, pacifistic mindset Federation Starfleet. Okay, yeah, I get it that your primary goal was the exploration of space and the pro and the, and, and projecting uh, the the Federation's high ideals and goals onto everybody around them whenever possible, without resorting to violence. Fine, but you have to believe. I have to believe that there's a core in the Federation, perhaps downplayed or even, you know blacklisted to some degree, we don't talk about it in the press, of combat-oriented, combat-trained officers and crew and ships. Now we see the resurgence of those occasionally, like when the threat of the Borg came up and they realized that they were woefully out, outgunned by the Borg, they just couldn't put enough destruction on a cube to, and, and without wasting a fleet of ships to do it, that they, re, they, they revisited their designs and come up with a number of classes that were specifically warship geared first and then everything else second. But I think at the core, somewhere, they maintain a fleet of those ships at all times as a deterrent or as a shield per se to buy time to ramp up production and refitting of the, the, the main fleets to bring them into a war footing. So, there might be this, this Omega fleet or this black fleet or blue fleet or what have you that's maintained solely for the purpose of kicking somebody's teeth in, making an extremely abrupt, aggressive showing with a small amount of resources, enough to shock and awe a foe long enough to give the, the main fleets an opportunity to refit and be redeployed. And therein lies where I like to run a campaign. I'll, I'll have members being, you know, these people are members of these this quote secret fleet or black fleet that nobody talks about. And their adventures revolve around mostly the occasional show of force where you know, Captain Kirk or Captain Picard has done everything they can to impress on a would-be enemy that the Federation is not something that's just going to roll over and be an easy pluck. And so they whistle up these guys, and these guys show up and put on an awesome display of destruction and or muscle to make the bad guy go, if this is a token of what they're capable of, perhaps we don't want to go that far or go that route. And that could be an alternate, you know, the, the alternate uh, Star Trek reality kind of thing, too, if that's how you want to look at it. As uh, playing in them, I mean, it's always been a challenge. And any game system can be a challenge when it comes to trying to fit the characters to a campaign. Or vice, more importantly, fitting a campaign around your characters. Get to know your players and what their strengths and weaknesses are and what their, their likes are and then trying to cater to them so that enough so that they stay interested and yet enough so that you stay interested because if you're not interested, you know, what's the point? You're not gonna put as much effort into something that you might or could have or should have. It's a matter of taste, I guess. But I noticed that and you either have a standard medium-sized character group three to five players and they can each have two characters representing different branches or positions within the fleet or another entity of the Federation government because like I said we're talking a bureaucracy are here of significant size so who's to say the Starfleet's the only thing that's out there I mean, no, I'm just saying there's uh, plenty of re room for other branches of the federal government to have its own, the, you know, mediators and, and, and uh, troubleshooters. So the other one is the small group where you have a solo group of one person or two people. And, and that can be a challenge by itself. And, and I've learned to actually learn to embrace the one and two 
because you get a more intimate setting and you actually and I think as a GM you have more control over a smaller picture instead of the bigger picture and you can focus more on those characters and, and the story develops and, and of course uh, their their encounters and stuff are adapted accordingly but uh, Star Trek and lends itself to those time those smaller groups as well because there's so many you know you take them out of the starship or make them a piece of a bigger crew but they're troubleshooters that the captain calls upon to deal with problems or to uh, uh, handle a situ given situation and in that aspect you could have a number of character uh, the cl each player could have a number of character player characters which to draw upon and field very uh, very on whatever the storyline is taking and the way to as a GM is to blend those together to the degree where okay uh, this 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 episode so and so and so so and so and so had to go deal with this and then on the following episode while well, they're either still doing that or recovering from whatever went down uh, this person and that person are tasked to go do something that's attached to or is a follow-up of the first one so they you're interweaving this bigger story together for a grander for a grander picture of how things are going so it's my take on that stuff the uh, possibilities in the games in in the Star Trek game is quite broad and quite wide uh, I've also think now I didn't run it but a friend of mine decided he wanted to run a campaign and so he ran one where we were basically traders and uh, we had a small ship there was four four or five of us playing and uh, we had a small freighter and he had us running around the the triangle area which is where the orion homeworlds are more or less located the uh, triangle if you're not familiar with it is the region of space where the federation the Fed, the federation the klingons the romans all kind of butt up against each other they form this triangular shaped section and within it is the orion colonies so we were running in and around that and i actually have a module or source book uh, called the triangle, if I remember right, and I and I pretty sure he used that as the basis for for his campaign. So uh, the possibilities are you don't you, know, you don't even have to be in Star Trek. You could be a Harcourt Mud for you know, or some character thereof. Lots of opportunities where their the opponents are the Federation, where the officers of some crew and officers some ship that happens to be patrolling your region of space keeps button heads with you. Or vice versa. I mean, the possibilities are there. So, I looked at it from a bigger picture as it goes. I mean, this typical TV series is mostly about a flagship of some kind operating in the standard Captain Kirk mindset, regardless of who the officers are. The, ex the exception that being uh, Deep Space Nine. And Deep Space Nine is a grand example of how things can be different. And I've always liked DS9 over all the other TV series for the exclusive reason that it shows elements of the, of the Star Trek universe from what I would think is a more closer to the real thing. Because you have people dealing with all kinds of races and, and all kinds of cultural and religious issues as well as things like currency. You don't see that in the flags. You know, the, the Federation, we don't get paid. Uh, not according to the older books, they do. They don't. Uh, according to the field manual, they got paid. Uh, matter of fact, there was references to Captain Kirk retiring and buying a, a property while he was, uh, you know, buying a property uh, on, a, on, a, on Alpha Centauri or something in preparation for the day he would retire from Starfleet. And those were in the novels, of course. The uh, fact that they don't run around with uh, gold press, latinum, or, or script, or things like that doesn't change the fact that they do have some... There is an economy, and it is money-based in the Federation. Starfleet itself, well, all your wants and needs are taken care of by the Federation, and pretty much you can go to your replicator and replicate. You get allotments 
and according to Voyager, you you know they were on a strict allotment program, but you get allotments to the to the replicator. So if you want to go and replicate into this thing or that thing, you could. You obviously had a means to acquire exotic materials because you saw that occasionally when uh, like Riker and, and other officers would come back off a of leave and they come back with something that they acquired on some planet where they were at. Well, I'm sure those individual planets, some of those did have an economy based on money of some sort. So there has to be some kind of, regardless of what the TV series would have you believe, uh, other than DS9, some sort of monetary system. Uh, unless we're bartering. I'm going to barter my comlink for that statue kind of thing. No, that's not going to happen. But, take that stuff into, into account, there's a much wider range of possibilities for gameplay. Of course, the average new newbie player to a Star Trek base game is expecting high adventure in the, in the steps, footsteps of Captain Kirk or, or Picard or Janeway or what have you. I, if that's what your trick is, do your, you know, do what you're going to do. Like I said, I think plenty of opportunities there for uh, a wide range of, of, of campaign possibilities. And I would advocate a smaller ship potentially a patrol vessel or like I said a quote police vessel uh, whose job is to to deal with the lesser crisis of the modern era I mean not everybody can be the enterprise and the enterprise can't be everywhere and there's a lot of things that the enterprise would be over qualified for so to speak and this is where the player characters step in with their their crew and their ship and so on now if you're one of my preferred vessels back in the day was from the Nelson class of, of early destroyers. This was part of a series that was built at, uh, along with the, the, the Constitution class heavy cruiser uh, as part of a response to uh, the, the Klingon War, uh, the Four Year War, I think it was called, or Seven Year War. Uh, just saying, right? So, some food for thought.